Breakfasts of the Ranchos. Pasadena, 1826. Aged woman accepts gift of great rancho. Pasadena, 1847. Army prepares for last stand. Pasadena, 1890. First tournament of roses held. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos a weekly dramatization of the colorful stories that abound in the history of the Southland. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, returns to tell another true story of life in the days of the dawn. The men on Bataan don't need to be reminded when it's time to fire their guns and cannon at the enemy. So let's not put off using our ammunition here at home. Let's not be slow or haphazard about our purchases of United States savings bonds. You can help our fighting forces and help yourself and your family too by working out a savings bond budget and investing regularly as many dimes and dollars as you possibly can. Decide right now to buy a savings bond tomorrow. Here is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, to tell us the story. Buenas noches, senoras y senores. Tonight's drama is woven around the beautiful Rancho San Pascual, the Easter Day Ranch, a great tract of land which cradles the lovely cities of Pasadena, Altadena, and South Pasadena. One of the most important of all the Southern California ranchos, San Pascual exemplifies perhaps more than any other the great strides of progress made in the Southland in the past century. Its story is rich in the romance of the ranchos. It was in the year 1781 when the first white men settled on the land which was to become Rancho San Pascual and founded the Mission San Gabriel, Archangel. And as the years passed, a thriving community grew up there. Thousands of Indians were brought under the care of the Padres, and their great establishment grew to include many varied activities, for they made everything they needed right there from soap and clothing to ox carts and sailing ships. And acting as housekeeper over this whole great establishment was the Padre's good friend, Doña Eulalia Pérez de Guillén. When this venerable lady came to San Gabriel in 1821, she was already 85 years old, as nearly as anyone could figure. But she was destined to live over 50 years more. She died at an age so advanced that no two historians agree upon it, the highest figure being 143 years of age. She'd been there for several years when good father Sanchez called her to him one day. Come in, come in. You wish to see me, Padre Sanchez? Si, senora. Come in. Sit down. Gracias. You have new instructions for the grist mill? No, the grist mill can wait. Mm, then no doubt you have decided on the confirmation of the new class of children, huh? When shall it be? No, not that either. I called you here this time for a personal chat. Personal? Uh, what about? You. Me? <laughs> what is there to talk about me? Signora, you're happy here at the mission? What see, of course. Why should I not be? Are you not happy with my work? See, of course, of course. Oh. Then why should I not be happy? It is the best home I have known. Oh, but you work hard and you receive almost nothing for it. And why should I? Am I not like you, toiling in the service of the Lord? I am more than fortunate to receive such fine living quarters. Clothes, food. <laughs> I would not ask for more. No, you wouldn't ask, but you deserve more. For you have given much, sacrificed much. You're not so young anymore, amiga mia. Eh? What is this? Not young. Perhaps not, Padre, but 
Neither am I old. No, no, of course not. I didn't mean to imply I, I only meant that, well, perhaps you might wish to give up some of your most arduous work. Relax. Enjoy your remaining years. You have done enough for two women in your lifetime. Why, I am only a little past 90 summers. I have another half century before me. Oh, let us pray so, Senora. But in all truth, it is not likely. You will admit. I will not admit it. For it is likely. The wise women have said it. I shall live to a great age, healthy and strong. Retire. Ha! I still have much life ahead of me. Si, si, senora, but... Retire. I, I have been seriously thinking of marrying again. Marrying again? At your age? Si, at my age. I shall still make a good wife. Uh, besides, we need another man here to help with the management of things. And uh, what better way? <laughs> Senora, I... Oh, well, who am I to say? Perhaps we padres know little of a woman's heart and less of a great woman like you. Perhaps you are right. I shall not fret about it. But uh, tell me, who is the lucky man? I, uh... I do not know yet, huh? but uh, I shall find him soon. <laughs> so, then perhaps I can still have a share in the matchmaking, eh? <laughs> perhaps, Padre. But uh, no more of this talk of me retiring, <laughs> eh? And I shall feel that you no longer have need of me. Senora, as long as there's a Mission San Gabriel, and as long as there's a Senora Eulalia Perez de Guillén... The two must go together as drops of water in the stream. I promise you that. We do need you. Gracias. That is better. And uh, I did not call you here to quarrel with you, nor to ask you to retire. I have been clumsy. You must forgive a stupid old man. <laughs> Nonsense, Padre. It is I who have been ungracious. Uh, what I really wanted to tell you was this. We've been blessed with your services these many years, and we're extremely grateful. We can hope that they may go on for another half century, but we cannot allow you to toil in our service and the service of these Indian children another day without showing our gratitude in some way. We wish to reward you. Reward me, Padre? See, si. Have I ever asked for reward? No, and that is all the more reason that we should give it, but we hardly know what to do. It lies beyond our power to offer what you really deserve. We're not wealthy. We have little of value, but we have thought it over, and perhaps, well, perhaps you would like a plot of ground for a home. A home with your new husband, eh? Oh. <laughs> a place where you might enjoy a little more of the goodness of life. Oh, but, Padre, that is too much. You must not But we must. Us. And since land is all that we have, we have decided to arrange for you to live on the land to the north of the Mission. Huh? It is not much. Just some three square leagues, three but... Three square leagues? See? Padre, what should I ever do with so much land? Uh, it may come in handy for you later. Who can say? But, Padre, can you give this land away? Is it not against the laws of Mexico? Oh, see, si, see, si, you are right. We cannot give it to you, but uh, only give you permission to live there and use it. And that only if the Indians agree to it. But they shall, of course, for they love you as we do. Padre Sanchez. Mi amigo, I, I do not know what to say. There is no need to say anything, senora. It is for us to add to this gift our thanks. And may you continue to prosper for your half century more. Father Sanchez went before the assembled Indian community and asked their permission for Doña Eulalia to live on the great 14,000-acre tract of Rancho San Pasquale. When he asked for anyone who objected to raise his hand, not a single arm was seen. And so, on Easter Sunday, 1826, Padre Sanchez spoke to Doña Eulalia. It is appropriate that this day, being Easter Sunday, should be the one on which formal permission to live on this rancho should be given you, Senora. For this is the land which Father Crespi described many years ago, La Savinia de San Pascual, the great altar cloth of Holy Easter. And so it shall be called the Rancho San Pascual. Rancho San Pascual, 
the Easter Day Ranch was still the property of the mission. But it was not to be for long. Father Sanchez played the matchmaker well, and soon wedding bells rang for Doña Eulalia. The old woman married Senor Juan Marine, a retired lieutenant of artillery of the Mexican army. Together, the couple took up their home at San Gabriel. By 1833, however, the Mexican secularization laws had been put into effect, and Senor Marine approached Father Sanchez. Oh, padre, now that the government is allowing the lands of the Mission to be distributed among the people, I, I fear for my wife, Rancho San Pascual. Uh, the governor will probably give it to the first person who asks. See, I suppose it is possible. It seems that anything is possible these last bitter days. Mm. So, Eulalia and I, we've talked it over, and I have decided to ask... Uh, <laughs> that is to ask... See, my son? Well, I have decided to petition the governor for a grant to the Rancho San Pascual. You too, my son. Oh, Padre, please do not misunderstand. We do not wish to contribute to the ruin of the mission, but... Such a choice piece of land will not be overlooked for long. And if the mission is to lose it anyway, we, we thought it would be best given to a friend, to my wife, for whom it was meant. See, you are right. It has been her right to live there for some years now, and she has deserved that right. See, I would rather that she should have it than another. Gracias, gracias, Padre. Then I will make my petition right away. See, and when they ask you, you may say that you have my permission. And so Juan Marine petitioned for and was granted Rancho San Pascual in 1835 by Governor Figueroa. But even though he went to the trouble to get it, this great parcel of land meant little in those days. He and Doña Eulalia continued to live in San Gabriel and kept only a few head of cattle in the ranch. And when Marine died in 1838, his heirs didn't even trouble to keep it up, but soon left the rancho vacant. According to Mexican law, this nullified the grant. And so, in 1843, Governor Michel Torreña chose it as his gift to his faithful lieutenant, Manuel Garfias, on the occasion of the birth of that young man's first child. But within three years came the news that Mexico was at war with the United States, and Garfias feared the loss of his rancho, and the Americans were victorious. So, Manuel Garfias rallied to the flag of General Juan Flores in battling the Americans. But soon, he too knew the Americans were victorious. It was on the day of January 9, 1847, as the California forces retreated from the Battle of La Mesa and pulled up their thinning ranks on Raymond Hill and Rancho San Pascual. Lieutenant Garfield, this is your land, isn't it? We'll see it, General. Then you know the terrain better than any other. You will direct the placing of the company so that we may make a stand here. We'll see it, General. And uh, may I suggest that you make your headquarters in my caretaker's house, which is just up the hill from here. And gracias, I will. We shall go there right now. Wait. Wait, General. There's a scout riding in. Si. The enemy has been sighted, no doubt. General Flores! Si. What news do you bring? General Clement's army has arrived in San Fernando. We're caught between two fires now, senores. Caramba. That is the finish. Si. That is the finish. We cannot even hope to fight them now. You mean surrender, General Flores? Yeah, for you Californianos, do whatever you like. As for me, my duty is to the Republic of Mexico. I'm going back there. You mean... You're running away? See, si, running away from where the war is finished to where the real fighting is going on, Mexico. Caramba, you are right. Even though the Americanos have taken California, they cannot hold it without winning the war in Mexico. Then perhaps the way to get California back is to leave here and join our forces down there. Precisely, Lieutenant. I am leaving as soon as possible, while I can still make my escape. I am going with you. Very well. Tell the men. Any of them who want to continue the fight may come with me. See, si, see, si, General. And we'll defeat the Americanos and save our lands yet. In Los Angeles County, there are today more than a million and a half separate lots or parcels of land. In the office of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles are books containing the complete title history of each and every one of these lots or parcels. There are some 1,800 of these lot books, as they're called, and they're large books, and the pages are ruled into columns, one of which is set aside for each individual lot. If your home is in Los Angeles County, there's a column devoted to it. In that column is noted a reference to every deed, mortgage, or other instrument in which that property is described, the parties to it, and the date of its recording. Also entered here are references to probate proceedings, divorce actions, in fact, any kind of litigation 
in which reference was made to this property or which was known to have a possible effect upon its ownership. There are some 50 public offices that are the sources of land title information. Representatives of the Title Insurance and Trust Company check all of these sources every day for new facts. All new entries, of which there are an average of about 1,500 per day for the entire county, are entered in these books the same day that the documents from which they are taken are filed or recorded. The lot books form one of the several important tools by which the company is able to provide you with title insurance protection so promptly and at such low rates when you invest your money in land. Lieutenant Manuel Garfias left his rancho San Pascual to fight with the Mexican forces in the south. And after their defeat, he remained there, fearful of returning. But when the news of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo reached him, he was overjoyed. Senor, senor, listen to this. Si, sí, Manuel, what is it? I am going to California. Are you crazy? There'll be a price on your head. You'll be thrown into jail immediately. No, no, haven't you heard? There will be no reprisals. The American government agreed to treat everyone as though there had been no war. They will pardon us all. No. Oh, that is wonderful news. Then we can return home. See, si. and more than that, they have agreed to recognize our ownership of the lands. My Rancho San Pascual is safe. It is mine. They will not take it away from me. Caramba, the Americanos, they do strange things. <laughs> si, si. <laughs> they go contrary to the rules of victory. Uh, perhaps it will not be so bad to have California part of the United States. Don Manuel hurried back to Los Angeles and built a lavish ranch house at the edge of the Arroyo near Cathedral Oak. And there, entertained his friends. It was the showplace of the county, but it had cost a lot of money for those times, and Don Manuel had had to borrow to build it. And so, one day, he went to his friend, Dr. John S. Griffin, who'd served as surgeon for the American forces during the war. Come in, Don Manuel. Come in. It's a surprise to see you here at this time of day. Gracias, amigo mío. What is it, a stomachache or a social call? Well, it's more like a headache, but not the kind you think I mean. Eh? <laughs> you sound like you have troubles, amigo mío. Si, many troubles. And most of all, I am troubled about the money I owe you. Oh, come now, you needn't worry about that, my friend. Just forget about it until better days. Forget about $8,000? <laughs> the worst of it is, it is not 8000 anymore. It's over 9000 for I paid you no interest. Well, times are hard, and I know what this land commission contest has cost you, so don't worry about the money. It can wait till you get back on your feet. But it cannot wait. I may never get back on my feet. Don Manuel, you shouldn't talk like that. I cannot help it. Amigo mio, I've about come to the end of my financial rope. That is why I'm here. You want another loan, my friend? No. I have a proposition for you. You took a mortgage on the Rancho San Pasquale to secure your loan. See, si, but you need have no fear on that score. I have no intention of foreclosing. No, I realize that, senor. But I want you to take the rancho. You want me to take it? See, si. I want you to give me another $2,000 for the oxen, horses, and farm implements and take the rancho. Don Manuel, I... Oh, I don't know what to say. Surely you will take it. Is it not a good buy? Oh, yes, yes, of course it's a good buy, but what on earth would I do with a rancho? Well, you starting off with a clean slate could probably make money on it. Oh. Or who knows, maybe someday a town will be built there. Oh, I hardly think that's likely, but... Uh... Please, Doctor, say you will take it. I don't want it, Don Manuel. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Well, then, just as a favor to me, it will help me out of my dilemma. Come just as a favor to me. Oh, very well. I'll talk to my friend Ben Wilson. See what we can arrange between us. And so by the time the United States patent for the Rancho San Pascual was forwarded to Garfias from Washington, the land was owned jointly by Dr. Griffin and his friend Benjamin D. Wilson. The patent, bearing the signature of President Abraham Lincoln, is the basis for all land titles in Pasadena today. Another friend of the two owners, Judge Eaton, lived on the ranch, and it was he who brought a visitor from the east to see the land one day in 1873. Well, what do you think of this country, Mr. Barry? Oh, it's right pretty, in a different sort of way. Oh, you mean it's not much like Indiana, huh? <laughs> I suppose that's what I mean, all right. I can't quite get used to it. Yeah, but you came out here to buy land. Oh, yeah, yeah. I represent the California colony of Indiana. We're looking for a place to settle, all right, but uh, 
Well, I haven't seen anything yet. It takes my eye. California colony of Indiana. Uh, it's a strange sound name. It wouldn't be so strange to you if you'd spend a winter back in Indiana. Hmm, pretty cold, huh? Colder than Blixen. That's what decided them. A lot of folks, after hearing so much about the perpetual sunshine, decided they were going to start an Indiana colony right out here. They sent me to pick out the land. You haven't found it yet, huh? Well, I haven't seen anything. It takes my eye. Well, you will. In just a second, too. And just wait till we top this rise here. When you look out across the Arroyo into that greenest, most fertile, most beautiful spot in California, nestled in the <laughs> shelter of the Tyrone Mountain. <laughs> Judge, you sound just like an auctioneer. Huh? And you may be right. Well, I know you'll agree I am right. However, I'll reserve my judgment till I have a look. All right, then. Yeah. All right, here's the top of the rise now. Yeah. Whoa, Betsy. Whoa, girl. Whoa. There she is. There she is. Rancho San Pasquale. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what do you say? Yeah. yeah, you may be right. Anyway, it uh, does sort of take my eye. After a more lengthy look at the rancho, it more than took D.M. Barry's eye. In fact, when the California colony of Indiana was wrecked by the Panic of 1873, he organized a new group in Los Angeles, the San Gabriel Orange Grove Association. They purchased 4,000 acres of land, and on January 27, 1874, founded a new town. It was not for two years that it was to receive its name. And then it was Dr. T.B. Elliott who suggested... Well, uh, how about a name like uh, Pasadena? Uh, Pasadena? Mm-hmm. Now, what's it mean? Well, it's, uh, it's a Chippewa Indian. It means something like uh, Crown of the Valley. Crown of the Valley. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah. And, and after all, that's what our town is, at the head of the San Gabriel Valley, the Crown City. Mm. Mm. It's a euphonious name, too, you see. It's huh? Euphonious. Oh, yeah, yeah, it sure is. Uh, sounds good, too. Well, uh, sort of takes my ear. Let's put it uh, to vote for the folks. The name Pasadena was chosen for the fast-growing little community, and now the farms began to give way to streets, buildings, and homes. The city was growing up, even though when the visitors stopped into the general store to inquire where the post office was... Uh, right here, mister. Just put your letter in the cigar box under the counter. It's for both income and outgoing mail. In fact, this cigar box is the post office. Improvements came slowly. But the population took a big jump after that day in 1885 when... The first railroad came to Pasadena, the San Gabriel Railroad, which linked Pasadena with Los Angeles. Civic feeling was welded by the appearance of the first Pasadena-published newspaper, The Star, forerunner of the present-day Star News, which ran its first edition in 1886. Four years later, in 1890, an event took place which was to spread the name of Pasadena all over the world and become the biggest single attraction to bring tourists to Pasadena. It was a pioneer resident, Dr. Charles Frederick Holger, suggested the idea. And why not an annual flower festival? Why, we could make a real spectacle out of it. It would really advertise our city all over Southern California. But the Pasadena Tournament of Roses did much more than that. Started 52 years ago, it has become one of the most celebrated of all civic festivals. It dramatically advertises to the world the mild climate of Southern California by its New Year's Day setting. And it annually attracts over a million visitors to Pasadena for the parade and the Rose Bowl game. As the population grew and Pasadena became known as an ideal residential community, the need for educational facilities grew. And so, in 1891, Amos G. Troop opened his Troop Polytechnic Institute, a school which was to become, in 1910, the California Institute of Technology, one of the world's great centers for study and scientific research. There, many great discoveries have been made, and on the staff are three Nobel Prize winners, honored as among the greatest scientific minds of our day. Dr. Robert A. Milliken, who first measured the electronic charge. Dr. Carl Anderson, discoverer of the positron. Dr. Thomas Hunt Morgan, awarded the prize for his biological research in genetics. And as Pasadena grew, so did its attractions for the tourist. In 1893, Thaddeus S.C. Lowe's dreamed-of inclined railroad up the side of a mountain that bears his name was put into operation. In 1904, 
Dr. George C. Hale obtained the funds from the Carnegie Institute of Washington to build the great Mount Wilson Observer, one of the world's finest institutions for the study of our expanding universe. In 1921, a group of traveling players stranded in Pasadena became the nucleus for the Pasadena Community Playhouse, an art theater which has become famous throughout Europe and America. In 1919, in neighboring San Marino, Henry E. Huntington founded his library and art gallery, repository for one of the world's finest collections of rare books, manuscripts, and paintings. And as Pasadena thus became a city unparalleled in cultural institutions, its growth as a residential community continued until today, its beautiful streets, its lovely homes, its unmatched civic center have attracted over 100,000 residents to the land of Rancho San Pasqual. This is indeed a story of progress from the great sprawling grazing land of Doña Eulalia's Rancho to the Pasadena, South Pasadena and Altadena of today. Such is the romance of the ranchos. The two adjoining tracts, totaling approximately 4,000 acres, bought by the San Gabriel Orange Grove Association for the purpose of founding the city of Pasadena, were purchased from one Thomas F. Crofts. The date of the sale was December 29, 1873. The total price was $25,000, or slightly more than $6 per acre. The land included much of what is now downtown Pasadena, where business property has recently sold for more than $3,000 per front foot. Almost as striking as the increase in value of that land is the increase in the number of separate parcels into which it has been divided, from two tracts the founders bought to scores of thousands today. As the land was divided and as individual lots and parcels were sold and resold, mortgaged, given, bequeathed, or otherwise transferred from owner to owner through the years, the task of providing title insurance service and protection has grown in both complexity and importance. In spite of this, the rates for title insurance protection provided today by the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles average lower than similar protection costs almost anywhere in the United States. And now, what's the story for next week, Frank? Next week, we'll recreate something of the life of another great pioneer of the Southland, John Temple, whom the Californians called Don Juan, and who owned much of the land which is Long Beach today. It's a story that has plenty of action and drama, so don't miss it. Until next week, then, this is your wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, is dramatized by John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss, with special music arranged by Gaylord Carter. Bob Lamond saying good night.